going. We have Dr. Melissa Wolf, who is the curator of American arts at the Columbus Museum of Art. Please. Um, Joe Jones is an artist who I'd like to talk about, and particularly in terms of his role as a worker artist. And interestingly, Pat and my um, talks go well together because I'm looking at the earlier period of the Communist uh, Party of the United States before the Popular Front, and she sort of talked more about Philip Evergood in, in a change in the Popular Front. In the summer of 1933, 23-year-old St. Louis artist Joe Jones and his wife and his patron, Mrs. Green, traveled to Provincetown. It was sort of a rite of passage, and you see over here, nice little picturesque Provincetown. Um, he had been a self-taught painter um, in St. Louis. He had started as a house painter with his father, and then he moved to decorative painting, and then he moved to painting portraits of illustrious um, citizens of St. Louis, and so they in turn sort of put their bets on him and paid for his way to go to Provincetown to sort of move up a step and sort of make a national name for himself. However, at the end of that summer, when he came back, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch didn't declare Provincetown makes an artist upon his return, but rather Provincetown makes artist a communist, <laughs> which was not what the um, city fathers were looking for. Um, to be fair, Jones did not find communism in Provincetown, although you could on every corner, <laughs> um, as much as he settled on it there. He belonged to a um, radical community in St. Louis, still had its left bank, not quite as strong as Provincetown, um, where they gathered together, and here I show you um, uh, a, uh, it's called the Blue Lantern Inn. Here's Joe Jones right there, and it was uh, situated um, in a, and I'm gonna quote myself, a rat-infested warehouse along the levee, and in, um, quote, gregarious dismissal of prohibition, prohibition era sobriety, they wrestled the overwhelming um, experience of a country in the throes of the Depression. And let me give a context to that um, overwhelming experience. In 1932, 20,000 businesses in the country went bankrupt. Wages on average were cut 40% in St. Louis. Um, unemployment uh, was at 30%. Toledo had 80% unemployment. St. Louis had one of the lowest relief rates in the nation. It was dismal. Um, and in 1933, 70% of African Americans in St. Louis were unemployed and 20% were underemployed. That brings you to 90%. There was a Hooverville in St. Louis that stretched um, for a mile along the river. There were 1,500 occupants. Um, police and watchmen were posted on the outside to keep these inhabitants from going into the city, from moving into the city, so it was actually, in some sense, almost like, um, like a prison condition. <laughs> Um, in 1932, there was the Bonus Army. Uh, World War I veterans, arguably one of the nation's most patriotic constituencies, asked the government to pay them their bonuses early. They started a march, beginning on the West Coast, hitching onto railroad cars, and that's what you see up here. Across the country, they gathered in on a sit-in on the nation's capital. Um, they were a peaceful, they eventually got into um, an altercation with police, the police um, went to the national government, uh, President Hoover dispatched General Douglas MacArthur, who was assisted by uh, later General Dwight Eisenhower to clear out. They used tanks, tear gas, and bayonets. Um, they torched the, um, the shanty town that they had built up here. Here you see there's a, a, a flag and policemen and uh, veterans, and then you see them sitting in underneath the bottom of the Capitol. A horrific um, national uh, image of, of what was going on in the country. Uh, the, uh, going along with increased economic stress, magnified racial tensions, the number of recorded lynchings dropped from eight in 1932 to 28 in 1933. That's more than one every two weeks. The Scottsboro Boys um, brought a kind of national uh, attention. In 1931, nine African-American boys ages 12 to 18 were accused of raping two white women on a, a railroad train. There was a huge series of trials, which I'll sort of talk about in a minute, but here you see a, a demonstration in front of the White House, um, and here you see the boys with uh, their attorney, a later attorney. Um, and then the uh, St. Louis Communist Party, which was very uh, strongly African-American. Um, such destitution and human suffering and seeming social collapse demanded action, demanded some kind of engagement by anyone even modestly motivated by empathy. 
And I think often our perspective on communism is too often easily influenced by our experience of its um, atrocities or its history and its downfall from, the, um, from, the, uh, from earlier in the centuries. But for us to see clearly what it seemed to offer in the 1930s, for many in the 30s, the rhetoric of classlessness, ec or classless economic and cultural equality central to communism seemed to offer a correction to what democracy was touted as bringing but was not. Regardless of what it represented for Americans before the Great Depression or now or for Soviets or for Americans like Jones, in the midst of the Depression, communism was a response to extreme suffering to that point had not been being addressed in a significant way by the nation's current governmental officials or structures. And I think sometimes it helps to understand these artists and people who joined the Communist Party in the 30s to, to give that sort of uh, context to it. And for Jones, for all its infighting and contradictions, and there were many, the Communist Party offered a model of action. The Scottsboro Boys case was picked up by the Communist Party after their first trial was a, a dismal failure of justice. Um, and their ILD, their International Labor Defense, provided them with Samuel Leibowitz, and that's who you see in that picture up there. They won a new trial in 1933, um, and I don't want to go on into that, but it was a complicated issue that went on. The CPUSA in St. Louis also acted on behalf of those suffering, and it gained widespread attention and respect for leadership of massive unemployed demonstrations. The Communist Party was pretty much in leadership of the unemployed councils, uh, which were set up around St. Louis. In 1931, there was an unemployed council uh, led the first of sit-ins, uh, of a sit-in of marchers. They came to the city hall from the north and the south, symbolizing um, racial unity from those two parts of the city. Um, it was a deadly sit-in. It was broken up by tear gas and clubs and, and death. Those in the arts formed a John Reed Club, which Pat has just talked to you about um, in St. Louis. And Jones joined with three radicals who he was very close to. Oric Johns, which you see up on the top, former drama critic of the St. Louis paper, The Mirror. He had moved to New York City and wrote poetry. He began to edit papers like The Daily Worker and The New Masses. Um, and later, he actually became the director of the Federal Writers Project in New York City. Jack Conroy, who was mostly self-educated like Jones, he was a writer born in a coal mining camp in Moberly, Missouri. He was first to write about the worker from experience. Um, he edited a little magazine, which were sort of radical magazines, liberal magazines, called The Anvil and later The New Anvil, which published such writers as Erskine Caldwell, Langston Hughes, William Carlos Williams, Richard Wright, and Nelson Algren, all leftist writers. The magazine's motto, which I love, was, we prefer crude vigor to polished banality. <laughs> um, and William Sentner, who was a childhood friend of Jones, and they played together in their um, elementary school, and who became a grassroots leader in the labor movement and later a major union leader. So Jones wanted to make his own production, that of painting, active in this radical milieu. As he declared, even before joining the John Reed Club, quote, I'm not interested in painting pretty pictures to match pink and blue walls. I want to paint things that will knock holes in walls. Wow. And so how does he do that? This is his draw to the Communist Party. Two questions that are going to shape my talk. Number one, what did it mean to be a communist artist, as Jones clearly decided he would be? And number two, what kind of art did a communist artist produce? What, ki what kind of art would knock holes in walls? Um, and to be a communist artist during the third period of the Communist Party, which is right before the Popular Front, 1928 to about 1935, meant that you were a class-conscious worker whose production, art, acted as a weapon to incite revolution that would end fascist structures of power and give workers control of their production. There was especially, in this period, a call to arms for members from the working class who were active in the cultural arts, authors, playwrights, painters, sculptures, dancers, sculptors, <laughs> dancers, and actors. Hailed with the celebratory titles of worker artists, worker writers, uh, they had claims of legitimacy as insiders in depicting the conditions and the concerns of the working class. They were the working class. Rather than using their cultural achievements to move up in a class-based society, which would be the typical move, they retained their working class identity in explicit opposition to the elite identity of the cultural world. Situated in solidarity with workers, they wrote or painted about the dynamics of their localities, coupled with an impassioned aim to incite within workers the revolution that would alleviate suffering and injustice. 
Oric John's, oh, Oric John's description of both Jones and Conroy shows how exactly these two radicals perfectly fit this bill of a worker artist. Quote, Jack Conroy of Moberly, Missouri, editor of the annual, was the new man, the agrarian industrial Ulysses of brutalized road life in America. The worker who learned Latin and mathematics by himself to enter the university, who wrote and wrote for years in obscurity, and he did, he stayed in the mining camps, um, in fact, who corresponds with everybody and reads everything. It is no wonder that he was fearless, that he smashed through the polite timidities and had his say. Joe Jones, son of a one-armed house painter of St. Louis, himself a member of a house painter's local, big, rangy, swift and swift thinking. Well, no intellectual ideologue, uh, like many of the leading communists, in fact, like Conroy and Oreck, um, who would argue ideology, Jones's communism was marked by an uncomplicated impulse that made him fit with the rank and file workers. He really was an ideal worker artist. He was the grandson of a stonemason and the son of a house cleaner. He quit school at 14 to support his family, who ended up on the relief dole. Um, interviewers described him as virile, turbulent, brash, boisterous. Um, he had a genuine, what, art, what reviewers in the East saw as this genuine Midwestern character. One described him as a blue-eyed giant. He looks the way his name sounds, of good, plain American stock with open face, freckles on his white cheekbone, and the hands of a man who can toss hay with the haying crew. He leans forward in this picture, I love it, with a simple utility table. He's all sweat and muscles and tattoo. A writer in the Art Digest gushed, a modern novelist inventing a creative figure to express the American scene in these years would logically find him somewhere in the Midwest would give him a plebeian name and most likely an artisan's background and would expect him to look a little like a baseball player, probably, to grin when he talks and to talk pugnaciously and with wisecracks. Society has invented Joe Jones in exactly that image. He was committed to the ideals of unionism. He participated regularly, in fact, in those unemployed uh, demonstrations. He and his wife did. He retained his painter's union membership and continued as a fine artist to use his painter's overalls, cap, and ordinary house painting equipment. He refused to work on a government project, though he was destitute because of union pay conflicts. He refused to exhibit in exhibitions while the local artist union was demanding rental fees for artists who put their works um, on display in museums. He refused to submit a work to a museum while it was being boycotted by progressives, expressing to a friend that he had, quote, always dreamed that someday I would be invited to that exhibition and win a prize, but he could not, quote, turn scab. Like Conroy, he maintained his ties to the worker, his class ties to the worker, and publicly positioned himself as a worker artist in contrast to the classist hierarchy of the cultural world. Upon his return from Provincetown, his sort of grand entry, he didn't open a bohemian studio to beckon patronage. Rather, he moved into a houseboat on the river next to the Hooverville, in, uh, within sight of it, immersing himself in the most extreme of human abjection. Uh, bodies were thrown into the river because they had died of privation and starvation and were just being thrown into the river. Um, he painted there fiercely and angrily, one, one critic said. So I hope what I've conveyed to you what a communist artist was called to be in the years, what a worker artist was when Joe Jones declared himself exactly that. My second point remains to, to explain what I believe a communist artist was called to create. In other words, what exactly was communist art in the United States? Well, the car context we've sort of looked at was American scene painting. Artists in the 1930s had been admonished to paint the world they knew best to paint everyday world of working class Americans, both its urban and rural locales. Farmers, city workers, tenements, small town parades, street children were all considered street fodder for fine art. So we've changed the subject matter to look at the everyday uh, world. This call to give a visual voice to the world of the commoner, to bring the world of the unwashed masses into the realm of fine art coincided with one of the most trying areas of, eras of our national history, the Great Depression. Many artists then who turned their eyes onto the street saw misery, injustice, and need. Um, their art acted as a testimony to the subjects they recorded. They assert the reality of these conditions, by, um, and such works are called social realism. Jones is of a piece. His communist art is of a piece with this social realist period. 
However, to be a communist artist during the third period entailed a more specific agenda than this. Worker artists were called to differentiate themselves from a pervasive documentary mode of social realism. Proletarian art was to be more than a mirror, it was to do more than to testify. It was to be a tool, a weapon, that would instigate class consciousness and ensure uh, revolution. As the leading communist artist Jacob Burke wrote, quote, it is up to the revolutionary artists to help pave the way for a complete break with bourgeois culture by developing new plastic revolutionary expressions which embody the aspirations of the working class for the desired classless state. Proletarian art needed to be aggressive enough to provoke its audience to act. It needed to operate in the imperative instead of the declarative. By that, I mean it didn't say, look at this fight. It said, fight. This posed a problem, however, for most American communists. And it might have even, for you while I read that quote, how exactly does one create such a work? How does one go about creating a, quote, new plastic revolutionary expression? It's kind of like saying, come up with a new color, mm. right? Most of the first artists attempting to create revolutionary images were illustrators and cartoonists. And they, although many of them did, did move from this, like, for instance, William Gropper. But they found it difficult, regardless of how accomplished they were, to move from the visual shorthand practices, um, the explicit texts, and the reductive symbolism that works so well in illustration, but seems then um, a little caricature caricaturish when it goes into fine art. Or, uh, in, in fact, uh, in 1932, the ACA Gallery in New York hosted an exhibition of John Reed Club artists. And Hugo Gellert's um, right here was, was part of that show. So you have, you know, big fat hat industrialist over here as well, the worker, the physical power of the worker, but these are very reductive symbols. On the other hand, there were trained easel painters like Edward Blanning and his 1931 painting Unlawful Assembly, Union Square, uh, which was shown also in this, the second John Reed Club members exhibition. This work demonstrates Lanning's artistic facility and his learned academic training, but it fails to evoke any urgency or conflict. It just seems like, in fact, it's kind of a parade. You don't get a sense of this, these policemen pushing down on the crowd. It just seems like they're sort of hurrying them along. Uh, so it, it misses the urgency, it misses the imperative. Uh, Jones's first chance to paint a mural as a worker artist occurred within a few months of his return from Provincetown, and it marked his most successful endeavor ever to bridge art and workers in class struggle. He was accepted on the Public Works of Art project, a government project of the New Deal, and he began to teach an art class two evenings a week for a racially integrated group of unemployed artists in the old St. Louis Card House. I should tell you the old St. Louis courthouse is where the original Dred Scott decision was handed down, and Jones did not waste time in, in making a point of that. As a collective unit, Jones and seven of his students, five of whom were African American, created a large 60 set, or 37 by 16 foot mural, which was done in chalk pastel, so it no longer exists, titled Social Unrest in Old St. Louis. It's a very typical mural format of episodic scenes. It's set along the Mississippi Levee, uh, River Levee. In the upper left, you see bonus uh, veterans, you know, and the veterans did stop in St. Louis. And as a matter of fact, the, the bonus, um, bonus army did, and Jones went out to see them. Down here, you see a pawn shop with the Blue Eagle of the NRA, the National Recovery, <coughs> excuse me, the National Recovery Administration. And it, but it's on a pawn shop. It says money to loan, and there's two uh, loiterers. Um, uh, uh, loitering that sounds has a negative connotation, but it suggests that work from the New Deal or assistance from the New Deal was like a pawn. It made you with the pawns. These figures are watching the only two workers. These two um, roustabouts or stevedores loading uh, loading a steamship. On the right hand side, uh, the scene begins with a baptism. Uh, a group of African Americans lined up for a baptism, and as you move past that line, it moves back, and I realize it's hard for you to see this, but um, it doesn't exist anymore, so this is the best image. It moves back into um, an, an orator and an act, it, it's, a, it's a group of activists 
centered around a soapbox orator. Um, and it merges the signs that these people hold, hold, save the Scottsboro boys, hands off Cuba, down with fascism, don't starve, fight, were all well-known slogans of the Communist Party. And you can kind of see some of the little placards back there, but you'll have to trust me that that is what they say. <laughs> Both sides of the mural tie together ideologically, the left depicting superficial institutions and solutions, moving to the right, which depicts in the back the communist solution. While its narrative devices are fairly conventional, this mural became, quote, the battleground on which to transfer the class struggle. And that was a letter from Orrick Johns. In the months following it, Jones and his fellow John Reed Club members maintained a combative dialogue with city leaders in March. The National American Bands of Action, which was a, a local fascist league group, broke into the classroom warning they would destroy the mural and inscribed in black letters on a sheet of muslin, quote, this is a public building, a building of the American people. We as Americans will not tolerate its use for the worship of any foreign idols or fetishes because it's un-American. It destroys homes and separates families. It destroys men as God meant them to be. We say that it must stop. Do you understand? We say must stop. Oric Johns wrote jubilantly to, John, or to Jack Conroy that, quote, after the destruction, the workers actually turned out en masse to defend the mural, the best example I know of rallying workers for their own cultural rights. So it wasn't John Reed Club members, it was industrial and city workers who, who, who turned out. However, when several members of Jones's class and his wife, Frida, were arrested during a communist demonstration at City Hall, the city had had enough, and when he came to teach his class the next week, the uh, director of public safety had padlocked the classroom and destroyed the mural. Wow. Um, while the mural's communist message brought about <coughs> acrimonious response by city officials, race also played an important, if less publicly acknowledged, role. The Communist Party, as we've heard, vigorously encouraged interracial organizing, um, it asserted that racial prejudices were per perpetuated by industrialists and landlords as a way to direct workers' antagonisms against each other rather than at those who controlled the system and oppressed both groups. So it's sort of dividing to win. And here you see a very typical uh, print, and you see these everywhere, of an African-American worker and a white worker merged together, and together they are, they are stronger. Um, so this is a very typical... Um, or a, very, a cause uh, among the Communist Party, but also a typical motif and image. By integrating his class racially, Jones situated himself not only against the art world and New Deal programs, which only marginally worked to include blacks. Um, he also confronted racial and class prejudices in a city that was still segregated. The National Bands of Action's warning, scrawled on a white muslin sheet rather than on paper, was a potent and, I believe, intentionally thinly veiled reminder of the, potent, er, of the potential for KKK violence. Chad Z, the secretary of uh, the city uh, councilman who locked his, the buildings, defense in evicting, in evicting the class was that, quote, the place is entirely lacking in the bohemian atmosphere you would expect if it was a genuine studio. <laughs> Jones says they are unemployed members of the depressed and downtrodden classes who want to study art. They don't look like artists to me. At the basis of this comment is the assumption that fine artists are neither working class nor African American. And importantly, in acting as such, they were stepping out of their place. This is, one suspects, exactly what Jones wanted to reveal. The mural then acted as an imperative. It said, fight. And sure enough, art, class consciousness, and racial oppression coalesced around the mural to incite members of the class to revolution. The conflict over this thrust uh, Jones into the national limelight. And in fact, he gave a speech at the very first opening Congress of the uh, American Artists Congress in New York. As I said, the Communist Party situated racial violence within the problems of economic inequalities. Um, and in 1933, in response to the sharp increase in lynchings, it asked in its publications, uh, it asked for an art that would, quote, explain lynching graphically and plastically. Communists are always asking artists to do really difficult things. We must attack the social forces responsible for lynching. And Jones's response to this is a problematic canvas, but it's one that is in our collection at the Columbus Museum of Art, and in, um, it was purchased during my... Um, uh, what do I want to say? My stay there. Uh, Jones's response to this is called American Justice. It's the very first explicit communist painting he created. It's typically read as a straightforward narrative of a lynching, 
Um, Jones's only comment about it was, quote, that it was, quote, it is my personal interpretation of a lynching that brought beauty out of such a fascinating subject. I want people to ask a question. Why do people who find beauty and love in a picture of a crucifixion painted by an Italian master, even to the point of purchasing it, why do they avoid a lynching, which is exactly the same thing, and the handling is recognized as beautiful? What this suggests is that we read the figure of the lynched woman as a martyr, as a Christ-like figure, which is how you read the figure, the, the crucified Christ, right, in a, in a crucifixion. Um, this draws on associations between lynching and Christ's crucifixion, which was a strategy utilized by the African-American community to oppose accounts in the mainstream press that denies the, the, um, the, the, the victim who was lynched um, and and um, make the, the Christian woman who usually is a rape, it usually was not, but it was it usually was imaged that way in, in, in a mainstream mind. Um, so it, it, it typically in the mainstream press it justified lynching as a retribution for an evil act upon a white Christian woman. Uh, the lynch mob, uh, lynch mob upholds the link of whiteness with godliness and blackness with sinfulness. To counter this, African-American authors told the story from the perspective of the victim as a Christ-like martyr. In the narrative of the black Christ, it is God who suffers and is embodied in the black man. And here I just show you an example of, of, of that so you can see the, the comparison. Jones's title is ironic in the vein of African-American press at the time as well. The Chicago Defender, an African-American press in Chicago, published a horrific and widely reproduced photograph of the 1930 lynching of Thomas Shipp and Abraham Smith in Marion, Indiana. Uh, and it's the two gentlemen who were burned hanging, and then there's a group of white people who are looking back at the camera and who are watching uh, the scene. And they, ca they published that photograph with the caption, American Christianity, with the irony of, of uh, to, to emphasize the religious hypocrisy. However, and Jones's title is ironic as well, but he doesn't title his work American Christianity, rather American Justice. And this is a very important shift. It moves the context in which we interpret the irony from the religious, from, from the religious to the judicial, to the secular. And this is a common motif in, in communist images as well, um, uh, to see lynching as part of a corrupt judicial system. And here's what you see down here. Orsagers print the law, and you see a lynching, but it's, he's lynched from a tree, uh, the roots which are in the judicial system and, and come out sort of corrupting that judicial system. So it is, it is um, lynched by that corrupt judicial system. It's also American justice draws on the idea of lady justice, which is every, oh, I forgot to put the title there, which is everything. Here you see a, a sculpture and a woman in a draped, you know, she's uh, draped in a gown. Her, her eyes are, are closed, right, because justice is to be blind. It is to be equal to everyone. And this is, I think, um, the height of irony in, in Jones's painting because, of course, the, the Kabbalistic um, group of hooded figures back here who, who hang around um, a fire, right, very uh, Kabbalistic and, and uh, devilish, are hooded. And with these tiny little eyes, in fact, they are the ones who are blinded by their hoods. Um, and so this is, again, this sort of corruption of justice. The figure who has um, the, the uh, drapery that's lay, uh, you know, over her as she lays, I think, is also a reference to this. Um, this is also tied to uh, a local, um, to a, a, a more local incident in St. Louis politics. Immediately before Jones left Provincetown, he witnessed and, in fact, participated in the back wings uh, an electrifying win by African American women to demand equal worker rights. And because it's unusual that Jones, in some sense, would pick a woman in a lynching scene, right? And part of my argument is that um, for Jones, the, the issue of justice um, and the demand for justice, which is what this painting is doing, uh, rested on African American women. In 1933, uh, the Funston Nut Company, the workers of the Funston Nut, Nut Company, went on strike. They were led by African American woman workers. Nut pickers were typically um, women, some Polish, mostly African American. They made some of the lowest wages um, in the city. They made $1.80 a week. Um, the women led the strike. The Polish women, the African American women, led the strike. The Polish women joined later in the first day. Three other nut companies then went on strike as well. Um, they struck for, I think, 
five days, and they won every single concession from the city that they had asked for, including equal pay for the African American women. So it was seen as this electrifying, and it, 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 it went through um, the labor community in St. Louis like, like lightning. Um, and so he leaves to Provincetown and becomes a communist with this, with this um, uh, moment. While it is a rare subject in its inclusion um, of a black woman as a way to reveal corrupt legal system, the painting is complicated and is in some ways not as good as you would want. It still continues the opportunity for privileged access to the female black body, or the black female body, which underlies the uh, um, unspoken um, access and, uh, uh, to a female black body um, that, continues, that continues today. So it struggles a bit. To, for its symbols, for the dog, the fidelity, the fidel, fidelity, fidelity, excuse me, the domestic house behind it, the woman, the conflation of all of that, in some ways, doesn't work as well as, the, uh, and this will be the last one, as the last painting that I want to talk about here, which is called We Demand. Um, it was produced one year later. You have an integrated line of workers led by um, four African Americans, this family unit, and then the uh, veteran right behind them. They, they stream out from an orator, again, who's speaking on a soapbox. Um, they come out from there, and they, uh, they, they, um, the apex of it rises into this man's hands, which are huge and elongated, and his step, which is you know, stepping out. Um, that is matched by this elevated train and the steel I-beams, which are, of course, production. These are the producers, the workers, and their production. Um, completing each other. Uh, the, the placard that he holds is, um, is the, uh, what do I want to call it, the um, Lundin Bill, there we go, which called for complete coverage for unemployed in all occupations, rural and, um, and urban. And one of the demands that was met by the Funston strike was that the St. Louis Board of Aldermen, one of the few cities, passed a revolution in favor of this bill. Um, and also the, the model for this strike was, um, and actually one of the leaders in the Funston Nut Strike was Bill Sentner, was this friend of, of uh, Jones's. And he modeled this figure on Bill Sentner, although he changed the, the racial identity of him to better reflect the idealized interracial um, um, activities of the Communist Party. Uh, let me just finish you up here and then we will um, rather than, as I said, um, characterizing the 1930s, Milton Brown wrote, class antagonisms, ideological positions, and economic, political, and social actions were sharply delineated. People took sides, made commitments, dreamed dreams. Rather than hanging or haranguing over positions and theories, Joe Jones aligned himself with the Communist Party because it acknowledged his working class experience and offered him a clear direction to move as an artist. As he stated years later, quote, Fighting was necessary to keep alive and be young. It was fun and it helped me to think. However, what set him apart from the rank and file of the, quote, shouters and the marchers, as he called them, uh, to which he felt akin, was that his anger and his artistic abilities coalesced to make him an, an exemplar worker artist who created some of the most individual and powerful visual calls to arms at a very crucial moment in our country's history. Thank you.